Okay, we've got a clock. We like to see that. Now we just want the preview to start running. And it is. And we've muted it. <clears throat> all right, I think all of our ducks are in a row. I think my seat is in the right spot. Got the proper amount of muttering. And now it's time for the camera. Good morning for those of you who, for whom it is, it is morning or good uh, in any way. It's the Every Other Sunday Show. Um, it's a sunny April 1st here. Um, in in the middle of Wisconsin and um, it's pretty chilly but um, it's been nice it's been seeming like spring but evidently in a couple of days we're gonna get like I don't know anywhere from five to ten inches of snow so that's bad uh, you know once it hits April Wisconsinites are generally done with snow we're like all right oh, this is over the top you don't need to be doing that you know, so there's that. <clears throat> so hopefully the weather people are are overestimating. Uh, hopefully we we get a dusting. I would like to see none, but you know that's what's going to happen. What's kind of happens? What's going to happen? We've got people here. We've got 105 people watching right now. Hello from Singapore. It's 2 a.m. Monday morning here in New Zealand. Well, you guys are already even closer to the snow than we are. I know that's not how it works, but you, you play along. Good morning from Kobe, Japan. First live show in a long time. Well, good to, good to see you here. Belgium, Czech Republic. Um, Grimlock Steve says quack quack for reasons. Uh, let's see here. We've got Austin, Texas. We've got the noob painter. Hey, I'm noob painter. How you doing? Moderator Matt is here. Let's see. Torch, 12 Neef. Um, let me see. We've got uh, New Zealand. Um, what else? Germany, Scotland, UK, uh, Dallas, Perth, Australia, Shenzhen, Japan, Finland, Denmark. Uh, Philip Wilkinson says, I was wondering when you were going to show us your booty again. Hello from England. Um, well, you're, you're going to see it. It's, it's all around me, which is probably not the right way to put it, but you know what I'm saying. Pennsylvania. Um... Let's see here. Netherlands. Nick Miller is building Drakari in Kenosha. Kenosha is in Wisconsin, way down in the bottom part. How you doing, Nick? Um, let's see. Arkansas, Austria. We've got St. Augustine, Florida. Oh, I've been there. When I was in seventh grade, we went to Florida. And I remember going to St. Augustine and hanging out at the fort. <clears throat> Uh, BC Canada, we've got Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, Heretic Dave says it's the negative 15 with plenty of snow here in Calgary. Mm, that's, yeah, I, I, when, did, when does the snow eventually stop up there? Here, normally, we don't usually have much in April, but sometimes we do. Um, but so yeah, hopefully, hopefully eventually you get a summer or at least a spring. Germany, Ireland, Bulgaria, Jesse from Milwaukee. We've got Australia, Minnesota, Kansas, Dallas. Earl Shaw is at the Chicago airport on the way back to Wisconsin. Well, that's fun. Jez Hunt in Newcastle. Um, uh, Potshot506 asks, has the cello been kidnapped? No. Cello has been moved a bit because there's been cello practice going on. So the cello has... Um, is, is got other things to do. It doesn't just sit there behind me and, and lurk. Sometimes it's got other things to do. Um, Netherlands, Berlin, Finland, Canton, Michigan, the Philippines, Maryland, Malaysia. Good morning from Tinley Park, Saskatchewan. I do love to say Saskatchewan. Um, Columbus, Ohio. I'll be in Columbus, Ohio in June. June, I think it's June for uh, Origins. We we got our um, email saying that our booth has been accepted for Origins. So Game Four, the the app, my day job, uh, will be at, at at Origins this year. So that's gonna be fun. Um, Dan Goat says, can you make a video on storage? 
Uh, actually, yes, that is coming soon. Um, I had to kind of get some parts together, and that's one of my upcoming videos. Like, not next week, but coming up, um, I'm doing a video on miniature storage and transport. So, you got that coming. Uh, what else have we got here? Do, 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 do. Um, Minnesota, the royal city of Bath. I've got a friend who went to Bath. I think with his mom. He went there when, you know, like back, like as a trip, because they both were Anglophiles, and so they went overseas and went to and visited Bath, and he still, I think, from time to time wears a t-shirt with the coat of arms of the city on it. Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, it's been a week since Adepticon. Um, hopefully some of you, I, I know some of you, I, I talked to at Adepticon. Um, I know Jesse and 12 Neef and obviously moderator Matt and probably met several others of you um, I got to, to say hi to. And there were a lot of other people who aren't in the chat here who I got to say hi to, uh, do selfies with. Um, just it was, it was a great convention. It's, as I say all the time, it's my favorite convention. And this year was no exception. Um, yeah, there was just a lot. Just it was great to great to uh, to see people to see the stuff out there, and uh, there was a there was a lot of cool stuff going on, and I brought a bunch of it back, as it turns out. So I'm just gonna get into it real quick because then we can get that out of the way, and then we can you guys can ask other questions and stuff like that. So this year, it used to be that you had to sign up very early for Adepticon to get what they call a swag bag. And they only had like the first thousand people get swag bags and then that was it. Well, they've changed the process now. Now, there are people who are like, yeah, I don't want a swag bag particularly. I would like to just buy the badge. So if that's like 30 or 35 bucks, you get the badge and you don't get any swag, which is fine. Um, for eh, 50 or 60 bucks, somewhere in there, there's the premium membership or whatever, and then you get the swag. And then there's something called the VIG, which is the very important gamer, where you get a fancy, fancy swag bag. I did not do the VIG, I just did the middle one where I got the bag, but didn't get all that extra fancy stuff. 12 Neef says, hope you can come to Nova. Uh, that is hopefully also in the plans. All right, so, um, oh yeah. So main thing, when you get there, you get a cool this thing which is what you saw in the thumbnail, okay? So this is one of those kind of weird bags. It's got straps that you can sort of use as a backpack, but if you put too much stuff in it, it will cut off your arms. So I didn't wear it as a backpack, let's just say that. Uh, let's see here. Desert Rats for Flames of War, that was in mine. And they're all not exactly the same. Sometimes there's slightly different stuff in there. Uh, Kador Command from War Machine. This is a nice hardcover as well. Um, I'm gonna. This is all gonna fall down. Let's see what else. Special thank you for your support from Weird. It's a figure. Let's see who's in here. I forget. I looked, but I forget now. Uh, Rowan Nilsson. It's a sprue. Tiny, tiny, tiny little person who's made up of like 28 parts because that's how they roll over there at Weird. Um, let's see here. Also, we got. There's a bunch of little flyers and stuff, which I'm not going to necessarily pull out. This is uh, Games Plus, a.k.a. Miniature Market, and they had like a little cool piece of like scatter terrain. It's like a little door, like a little uh, bulkhead sci-fi door. Um, uh, this is a sprue of um, Beyond the Gates of Antares, so I'm pretty sure. Uh, what else is in here? Oh, yeah. There was a hardcover about... Big Bobby G, Lord of Ultramar, uh, Big uh, Robot Gorilla Man, um, whatever his name is here. Um, yeah, so this is the Primaris series. That was cool. Um, I will probably read that. Oh, yeah. And uh, everybody got one of these, too. Um, exclusive Primaris Intercessor Veteran Sergeant 30th Anniversary and stuff like that, which is super cool, except I bought one recently, so now I have two. So... Uh, I might modify this one somehow, try to make them look different. Uh, but that was really cool. What else is, there's a bunch of other stuff here in the swag bag. Uh, no, I already pulled that out. Like I said, a lot of uh, flyers and things. Oh, um, this is from God Tier, which is a new game from Steamforged Games, the guys who make Guild Balls, or Guild Ball, and stuff like that. Um, 
some paint from Reaper, Master Series paint, a little bottle of that, um, uh, a little dude from Miniature Building Authority. I'm going to show you a bunch more mi Miniature Building Authorities as well in a bit. So anyway, there's a bunch of stuff that was in this bag, which I'm going to put over here. And speaking of Guild Ball, <laughs> everybody also got one of these. This is the Guild Ball Kickoff two-player plastic starter set. So it's the board, it's the plastic dudes, it's the whole deal. I think one of my cats just opened the door. Get out, what are you doing? <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, this is, um, this was, everybody lugged this around for a bit uh, once they had the announcement, or the, the start of uh, registration and you could pick up your bag. So this is really cool. I don't play Guild Ball, so I'm either going to, my current plan, really honestly, is I'm probably going to actually have this be a um, door prize at TMX coming up. Um, so this will probably be a door prize amongst some other things as well. There will be plenty of door prizes this year at TMX, but this will be one of them. This is the big two player. And it's heavy because it's got, like, it's got the pitch. It's got all the stuff in it. It's like, it's nice. I think this was like a hundred bucks if you were to buy it. But, um... Yeah, that was also part of the swag bag. Um, hang on a second. Also part of the swag bag from Cool Mini. Uh, Dark Age. This is a two-player starter as well called Path to Glory, which is kind of a strange name for what I know about the game. Path to Glory seems like... Anyway, um, comes with a bunch of figures and uh, from the Forsaken and from the Dragiri ice cast and um this will also be a uh probably be a uh door prize as well <clears throat> so yeah i'm also going to be reaching out to other people who weren't giving away free swag at the at adepticon i'll be the other companies to get more uh door prizes for tmx last year at tmx I didn't have door prizes because I was just barely 100% sure that the actual convention was going to occur because there was issues with the venue. This year, those are all nailed down. Everything's cool, so door prizes. Probably stuff from... I've already talked to people from uh, Mantic and Osprey, and so I, they've both said, yeah, we'll totally send you some stuff. So we got that going for us, which is nice. Um... Let me see here. What else have we got? Got some quickie questions here. Hmm. All duplicate Primaris must have a meeting with the hobby knives. So say we all. Yeah. No, I can definitely see that. I'm like I don't know exactly what I can do with him, but I'll probably try to do something. Maybe give him a different head. Put a beastman head on him. That would be friggin' sweet. All right. Um. So more terrain. So I bought a bunch of stuff from Gale Force Nine. Uh, they do their battlefield in a box. Um, I'm going to try to... So these cool Badland tours, they're like these just crazy, like, wind-blown sort of rocky bits. These are already pre-painted. Like, these are done. I don't have to paint these. They're just nice resin, but they're already pre-painted. These guys make a lot of cool stuff. And this was uh, 25 bucks for these pieces. And it's a good heavy box. And so um, I picked those up. I also picked up... Um, some of the they have like this kind of ruined I don't think I have it in here or is it in a different oh no here it is but it doesn't have a picture I don't think nope I'm a liar um, this stuff this is war torn or village small corner um, it's kind of like a Tudor style kind of house you know thing and um, these are also pre-painted and, and really nice I have some of the two story versions that I picked up a couple of years ago, or at least a year ago. Maybe it was a... I think I picked them up at Gen Con. But um, I didn't really have any of the small ones. And so they had some of the small ones, so I picked those up as well. I think I have two of those. Yes. And what's in this plastic bag? Um, if rustling noises are problematic for you, you might want to turn down. Just going to say, because uh, there's a lot of that. Oh, uh, I got some free stuff from Gaddis Gaming, our friends at Gaddis Gaming, um, for their Shattered Crown uh, World War One alternate World War One game. 
Um, they had a couple of different figures there, which are very cool. And um, what do we got? Uh, Princess Victoria and August von Meckenstein. So uh, the two of the guys that I work with both bought armies for Shattered Crown. So um, I want to see how those work out, and then um, I will potentially go down that road as well, which is going to take... I've got enough stuff going on. One of the guys actually at work, this is his first ever miniature game, really. So, like, this is the first stuff he's painting and building and stuff. So I'm going to be helping him with that. So it's kind of like it's par partially my army, but not really. What's in this plastic bag? Oh. Uh, miniature Market, like I showed you before, uh, Games Plus or whatever, they had um, a lot of scatter terrain. Um, I picked up a bunch of just sort of random scatter terrain. That's what's great about this kind of convention is that you can just, like, you just got, like, bins full of, like, this stuff. Like, there's some crates and some jersey barriers and some, like, other stuff. This is, like, a, a broken uh, column, you know? And then you can just put these things into your terrain. You can put these things into all kinds of different pieces. I'm going to be doing a video about scattered terrain coming up, actually, also very soon. I'm doing one about miniature transport and one about scattered terrain, and they're both coming up quite soon. Um, because I'm a big fan of scatter terrain, so yeah. Um, let me see here. What else have we got? Here's another bag. Okay, so there's this company called Armorcast that's been around forever, and they make resin terrain. Like I've said, I bought a lot of terrain this 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 when I was here. So uh, resin terrain. I did a video, uh, uh, Uncle Adam's Pro Tips, back at the end of the year last year about how you have to be careful with resin terrain because as you're sanding it and cleaning it and stuff like that there's dust and you want to wear a mask because otherwise you'll you, you won't I don't know if you'll die but you'll irritate your lungs which nobody wants to do so but resin terrain is kind of awesome stuff I like it a lot so anyway um there's a guy at Adepticon every year who's this humongous booth it's a company from Toledo called the game room I forget what the name of the company is but he's known as the bits guy so when you go to Adepticon, or even now he's at Gen Con these days, that kind of stuff, he just has a humongous booth full of these big Rubbermaid Tupperware type uh, bins, and you dig through all the bins and you find these little plastic Ziploc bags full of like shoulder pads or heads or left arms or whatever, and it's stuff like that so you can build your own guys. But he also this year had several tubs full of just terrain, and it was all armor cast. So... Stuff like this, which eventually the light will pick up. So these are like ruined brick buildings in a baggie. And um, you just basically kind of sand them a little bit and, and kind of clean them up, clean off the mold release stuff, um, glue them together, and then paint them. So I've got a ton of this stuff. So this is like ruined brick buildings. These will work for World War II, uh, alternate history World War II, post-apocalyptic, like... Wreckage, which was really my main... I'm looking to build a bunch of Wreckage stuff, so that's why a lot of this stuff is going to look post-apocalyptic, but I can also use it for some other things as well. Um, here's another... Oh, that's the back side. There's, again, armor cast. So you've got these kind of shot-up buildings. You'll see, like, how the windows seem like they're closed. That's just flash is what it is. So it's the mold process, like the a little thin layer of, of the, the resin gets in there. So you just kind of carve it out real quickly with a hobby knife. It's super thin. You can actually just poke through it with your finger. But, um, yeah. And there's, like, you can see there's also maybe here. You can see that other piece that's, like, that's the floor, you know, and the, you see the, the joists in the floor and everything like that. I mean, it's, it's really nice detailed stuff. And the company has had a weird history where, like, they've been, like, really kind of doing well, and then they go to business, and then someone else buys them, and then they go really well for a couple of years, and then they go to business. And um, it, up in the Bits trading area, which is different than the Bits guy downstairs, the Bits trading area is on Friday and Saturday night. People can go up there, and there are tables, and you pay, like, a buck. And then you can put a bunch of the stuff that you want to sell, like things, games you don't play anymore, models that you've got extra of, or whatever, and you can kind of, it's like a rummage sale, or a yard sale, or a garage sale or car boot sale or whatever you call them overseas um anyway there was a dude there who had tons of armor cast and uh not only even in plastic bags but he had just a bunch of loose stuff that was like all like weird miscasts and he was selling it by weight 
and I was talking to him, and it turns out he's the new owner of ArmorCast. Like, he's just a guy who bought the, the company now, and because it's he probably, it what, probably wasn't super expensive, because like I said, they go back and forth, and but <clears throat> I've always liked their stuff. I think it's good stuff. Um, let's see here. What else have we got? Oh, geez. This is heavy. Oh. Um, <laughs> so I took a class. I, I taught two classes while I was at Adapticon, and I took a class from our man, Sam Lenz. It was his first year teaching classes at Adapticon. I was unable to get into his first class because it was during my first or second class. I think it was during my second class. But I was able to get into his second class, which was called Layering for Smoothness. This year, in all of the hobby classes, we had free stuff to give away. They, the, you know, Adapticon was like, here, give away these, these things that have been donated. And so we had like a ticket thing or whatever. And uh, I won a box of Poxwalkers, which was very nice. Because I have a Death Guard army, in theory. So I will eventually um, add those guys to it. Um, you know how I talked about how I bought a bunch of uh, resin from uh, a guy upstairs who now owns ArmorCast? Well, here's the rest of it. So here are some kind of like like post-apocalyptic sort of stuck-together barricade-type cement walls. Here's a bunch of piles of brick. Uh, here's more low brick-type walls. The trick is, is that when I get all this painted, which is going to be a big project for the early spring, this is all going to end up on tables that are all going to end up being battle reports for the channel. So that's one of the reasons why I was like, you know, I'm going to try to buy a bunch of terrain so I can really have nice looking tables. <clears throat> so there's that. Uh, these are giant like craters or piles of like old barrels and, and crazy stuff like that. There's one on each side. You can paint these all up to be look real rusty and, and grungy. I'm just precariously balancing this right now. Should have thought this through. Uh, more brick ruined buildings and more. This is almost like kind of uh, 40k sort of gothic ruined bases to buildings. That's all that's in this bag. So, again, it was a lot of resin that I brought home. But that's not all of it, I'm sure. Uh, let's see, what else have we got here? This is a heavy bag. Oh! Alright. Again, I apologize for the rustling. So, there's this game that I talk about from time to time, and it's called Wreckage, and I'm a fan. And uh, moderator Matt here, he's the man, uh, or one of them, uh, that, that does it. And last year during Adepticon, they had a Kickstarter for, um, uh, like, I think it was the 2.0 rules and also the new vehicles. Well, the vehicles, these nice resin, kind of almost slightly, vaguely, you know, post-apocalyptic, I'm not saying Mad Max, because they're not really, but they're definitely post-apocalyptic, more realistic uh, vehicles. Um, they're, gonna get, they're, they're being shipped now, from what I understand, but if you were at Adepticon, then you could fulfill your order while you were there. And I was. So, here's some of the vehicles that you can check out, if I can get them to focus a little bit. I don't know why this seems to help, but it does. Now, you'll see there's a giant doohickey on the back here. That comes off. That's like the, the resin gets poured down in here and it runs down inside and whatever. So this just comes off. Like that, this would be weird if it was the part of the, but yeah. So anyway, um, got this cool truck and what else did I? So I did because I did the Kickstarter last year, and you could either just get one vehicle, two vehicle, or all three vehicles. I did the all three vehicles last year. So this is um, another truck with like a cool tarp over the back, you know, like a box truck, really nicely sculpted, in my opinion. And then this is like a smaller kind of car. And it's got space like here, like you can put a tire on the side, you know what I mean? Like, so it's like, a, it's got like an extra spare tire on the side and like you can put other stuff on the top and they're kind of modular. Um, so those are the three main resin body parts. And then they come with a whole bunch of kits. Like this is like wheels and bumpers and barrels um, and you know, stuff that you would carry along 
uh, and so you can, so everybody's vehicles can look different. You know, like I put my vehicles together one way, you put yours together a different another way. So yeah, it's going to be, it's it's that's those are going to be a lot of fun, um, and those I believe right now are, like I said, they're being shipped to all the other. Um, Kickstarter people, and then I'm pretty sure right after that they'll go up on the website if they're not up on the website already. Uh, moderator Matt will be able to speak better to that. <clears throat> this is more resin, but I, I, it's all wrapped in bubble wrap, so I can't really show it to you very well. Uh, I think I can show you maybe a picture up here. So there's this company called Miniature Building Authority, and Miniature Building Authority has been around for a long time, and when I first came across them, they made really nice terrain, which they pre-painted, and it was crazy kind of expensive. Like, it wasn't, like, too expensive for what it was, but it was very well painted, and that takes time, and time is money. And so I used to look at it and go, eh, that's, yeah, okay, that's, uh, you know, I like that, but it's, like, 112 bucks for, like, a small building, but it's really nicely painted. Well, I think that they still do some painting stuff, but they've also taken the idea of, like, well, if we sell it for cheap-er, because we're, un we're not painting it now, then you people will buy it more frequently and they may not actually ever put it on the table because they just buy it and then it sits in their basement but they still buy it so we're making money um so now they sell a lot of their stuff if not all of it basically um is unpainted resin so this is a good sized this is a, uh, it's this is a like this is like two shanty buildings kind of put together shanty town post-apocalyptic kind of stuff so i don't know if you can see yeah, not really. I've talked about them because I bought some stuff like this at Gen Con this last year, and now I've purchased a bit more because, again, it's going to be part of the post-apocalyptic stuff that I'm doing, and those are very cool. Oop, I found some more armor cast. This is like a, a ruined corner, which is pretty cool. Again, brick. A lot of brick. Um, at one point, I stopped at the Army Painters booth, and I purchased from them this which was on sale kind of like they had a, like a convention special so this is a kit i'm just going to take it out of the plastic that's it i'm taking it out of the plastic I'm completely ruining the resale value so uh it's like a little pouch it's got a zipper in theory and in here you have the ability to put it's like a little kit that you take with you when you go gaming. Wrong way. Okay. So you've got extra glue so that you can fix things. You've got two laser pointers, which are currently the batteries. You've got the little tab in them so you don't waste the batteries. One is laser pointer and one is that line, you know, so you can like check line of sight, which is really cool. Uh, tape measure. And then this pouch is full of dice. There's like red and green dice, I think, in there. So um, it's just a nice little kit and it was like 18 bucks. So I think it sells usually for more, like if you were to buy it from your local shop. And now I can't find the zipper pull. Um, but yeah, it's a nice little kit. It's just something to kind of throw in your bag and go to town with that. I mean, the little laser pointers alone, I mean, granted, you could probably, 18 bucks would not get you the laser pointers. They would, you know, the laser pointers are usually not that expensive. Um, but the line one is always kind of nice like a normal cheap laser pointer use with your cat or whatever that's those are three four bucks usually at the pet store all right and the pouch is problem problematic to, to to zip right now all right um what else did i get this stuff this is called army painter magic and it is super glue activator a lot of other companies make stuff like this um zip kicker sometimes it's called basically what it is is that when you spray super glue or you spray sorry when you put ca glue super glue whatever you want to call it on a model you can take this and go spritz spritz and it will almost instantly harden up so that you're not having to try to hold the arm to the body for a really long time something along those lines that can be problematic um the reason i bought this because there's a lot of other companies that sell it is that it's just a really nice small glass bottle of it a lot of times I've had another bottle of Zip Kicker that was a bigger bottle. It was plastic, and it leaked like crazy. So um, this is a nice little glass bottle. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to having this in my kit as well. I may just put it in that little bag that I had, if I can ever get it closed. What else is in here? Uh, more terrain, in case you were wondering. This is more stuff from Miniature Building Authority. These are post-apocalyptic shantytown walls. There's... They're five bucks a piece. Uh, and there was another shanty in here as well. 
about yay size. Um, that I picked up, I think, on Sunday. Like, I was about to leave, and I'm like, ah, I should get some walls. Um, what else? Oh, from the bits trading thing upstairs that I talked about uh, at one point on Saturday, I think, there was a guy, I was walking around looking at people who were selling stuff, and this guy was selling the Imperial Space Marine 2016, which was basically a redo of this original uh, old guy over here out of metal. The original Imperial Space Marine not included and now they've made him out of plastic and a better sculpt, frankly, like a cleaner, you know, sculpt. But um, anyway, he's in there. So I picked this up for, like, they. Uh, this was limited edition, I guess. So um, it was not opened. I opened it. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to trying to use him in some sort of thing, too. Uh, let's see. How else are we doing here? Speaking of vehicles, I'm looking to get into bolt action, and it seems most people use an airbrush to do vehicles. Is it possible to get decent results with just brushes? It is, but you're going to want to use really wide brushes. A, because it'll go quicker, and B, because it will give you less brush strokes. Um, yeah, something like that. Uh, that's probably your best bet. So, yeah. What else have we got here? Um, ba -ba 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 -da. We've got stuff going on here. Um, what oh, hey, Blake. Blake Gaskins is here. Blake from Life After the Cover Save. Big nasty bee. Uh, let me see here. Miniature Building Authority. we got a link there. We've got a link to Wreckage. Uh, Hernan Castro says, hey, the cello is missing. It's true. It's been, it's doing things. I mean, not right now, but it was, it, it was being, uh, it was, there was practice. There was cello practice, and so it's been moved. Um, also, Matt says he bought a whole bunch of those um, post-apocalyptic walls, too, because they're very nice, I think. They're very nice walls. Here's another bag. What's in here? I'll bet it's terrain. Another shanty town. I don't know if this one I've already showed you. Anyway, uh, let me see. Where else are we at here? We've got... Oh, okay. So Wednesday night. Everybody gets there. Well, not everybody gets there. I got This is the first time I've ever gone on a Wednesday night. Usually I go Thursday in, in the morning. But this year I went there Wednesday night because on Wednesday night, Games Workshop does their big press hootenanny where they talk about new stuff and everything. Last year... They came out with a whole bunch. This was the first time they'd ever done one at Adapticon. Talked about all kinds of stuff. And at the very end, they're like, oh, yeah, by the way, Shadespire. And then they dropped that. And everyone was like, what? Well, this year, uh, I mean, it was still a good presentation. But they didn't have, like, a big at the end, like, oh, by the way, here you go, Mordheim. You know, or anything like that. There wasn't any, like, big, oh, one more thing and then something amazing. They just showed off a bunch of cool stuff. They said that some stuff is coming, like, oh, there's going to be an Imperial Lights Codex, to which everyone went, went, well, yeah, we kind of figured there would be, you know. But they did the big presentation and showed things off. And then they showed off and talked about the Deepkin, which they had been talking about for a while. And if you've been watching me for a while, you know that I was really hoping that the Deepkin were going to be fish people because I love big, bug-eyed, scaly, murloc looking fish people that's what i wanted i wanted them to create fish people what they did was wet elves they just basically made elves that ride turtles and are moist i don't know I, wet elves was not the thing i was hoping for so i was a little disappointed about that the other people liked it that's cool that's 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 awesome for them i was kind of like i was hoping for fish people so while i was walking around adepticon at one point i found some fish people so i bought this box um, this is Masters of Devil Reef from a company called Crucible Crush. It's very glary. Um, you get uh, eight metal deep ones and one resin Dagon, which is right up my alley. Um, I posted a picture of them on Adeptic, or sorry, on Instagram during Adepticon, so you've probably seen some of these guys. But I did end up buying a box of them. Um, this is what I wanted. This is like I wanted GW to make these guys. I wanted the little, you know tummies and the little webbed claws and the bug eyes and the whole deal that's what I wanted not wet elves but you know you get what you get so uh, I picked these up gonna use them for I don't know what but I'll paint them eventually and uh, and do something cool with them and so you just don't see a lot of models like this so I wanted to make sure I picked some up uh, let me see we're getting there we're really getting there 
Uh, this is another one of those. And let's see. One of the last things is, so there's a company called Imperial Terrain. And I, they are, they make, they predominantly make STL files. So for those of you that don't know, um, STL is, I don't know what it stands for, but it is basically the type of 3D file that you um, use to make 3D printed stuff. So there are companies out there, and I did a video about this earlier, about three, four months ago, excuse me, where you just Basically, all you need to do is you go to these websites and then they make the shape and then you buy the shape from them. Um, you know, it's maybe 10 bucks, maybe it's five bucks. It's hard to say, depending on how they sell it. And then you can use that shape. And then if you've got a 3D printer, you can print as many of those shapes as you want. And maybe it's castle walls, maybe it's a dungeon pieces, maybe it's sci-fi stuff, you know, whatever. So um, Imperial Terrain is another company that makes those. And I like the stuff that they do. Um, a lot of the stuff that they do looks like it could be used in a game about wars and the stars um let's just say that but it is not you know exactly so anyway uh they had a booth there this year at adepticon and you know it's kind of hard to sit at the booth and be and sell people digital files because that's not kind of how it works so they also just cranked out a whole bunch of the terrain that they make files for they just printed it and brought it and then sold it to people so people who don't have 3d printers could also buy it i do have a 3d printer but this was a really cool model so so this is a 3d printed it's it's again it's a little star warsy you know i mean kind of but i like how it's sort of distressed and beat up it's got some some like already like it's missing some stuff it's got like dents in it and things like that and uh and it's got a door you know so it's it doesn't exactly absolutely scream star wars but it's it's definitely kind of cool looking you know it's like it's got the window vents on this side but on this side one of them has been kicked out or whatever and so i'm going to really rough this up and again go post-apocalyptic with it put a bunch of stuff back here you know shanty it up maybe or whatever that kind of thing i'm not sure yet because again like i want to build a really kind of fun like i said uh like wreckage sort of table well wreckage is post-apocalyptic but it's not like the apocalypse happened now it's like it happened several hundred years in the future so there would be some futuristic buildings which would also be ruined and screwed up because of of you know the the, the collapse so i didn't want to have everything look like it was a normal current building i wanted some things to be also ruined futuristic buildings so that's what i'm going to do with this but it's a nice big piece um you know it's like hollow and you can see the 3D printing shenanigans going on inside there. But it's a really nice, smooth piece, like a little bit of wet sanding. Like, you can't really barely see much in the way of the normal telltale, you know, uh, lines in that 3D printing. Like, if I move it real close and we get a good focus, you can see a little bit, but not much. It's really nice stuff. So, um, I bought this from him and also... 3D printed little barricades, which are currently wrapped in um, full wrap. Anyway, so they're cool. They look like barrels and boxes and a bunch of other junk. So amazingly, I think that's it. I think that's pretty much all of my booty, as it were. Um, I don't... Th oh, no, it's not. Well, it's all that I can show you here. <sighs> On Sunday, I did also buy something that was not terrain and not fishman. Um... So this is the last of it. Just FYI. Uh, let's see here. Um, so where do I got to go? I need to go here, and I need to go here, and I need to go here. So there's this company called Creature Caster from Canada. Um, and they, I've been hearing about them for quite some time, and they do really super, super cool stuff. Big resin models, like big, you know, this thing, this thing is tall. Anyway, um... This was the first year they've ever been at Adepticon. They had a big booth. They sold out of almost everything. So the stuff that I ordered from them, they were shipping for free, which was great. Um, and they're just amazing looking models. So this is the Lord of Vir Virulence, and he's pretty cool looking. Uh, in, in, and the thing is, is like I could use these for like a Games Workshop game. This could be like a Demon Prince, potentially, or something like that. I don't know if I'm going to go down that road. I've never been a display painter, but when I saw these models like in the flesh, um, just unpainted, I was like, man, I kind of want to paint that. So, um, 
yeah, so they're just, and they've got options, like this one can either go with the big giant scythe, or he can go with the big giant axe, and then the, like, almost like a power fist sort of a thing over there. Um, it's also got a sword and like a power fist sort of thing. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on there. They're really cool looking models. It's got a butt. <laughs> That's sort of fun. Um, but yeah, and he doesn't have to use the wings. He's got like a plug that you can put in the top to get rid of the wings. Um, yeah, it's just, this is a super cool looking model. I really like this one. And then I was like, well, these other ones that are pretty cool too. So I also picked up the Plague Angel as well. He's also very cool with the crazy angel wings and the giant bone scythe and the whole thing. Um, yeah, I don't think he's got much in the way of options. He's pretty much got the bone scythe thing and that's pretty much it. Yeah, he doesn't really have much in the way of options. But you can see he is, uh, let's see here, he is nine inches tall up to the top of his wing up here. Uh, that's like a space marine down there and that's how tall this guy is. He's very tall. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to getting him. And then I also got a third one, cause you know. Um, and this one is the Maggot Demon. And uh, his name is pretty much, he's pretty much what he is on, named on the tin. Um, he's got maggots. And a weird, crazy, like, uh, I don't know what the heck, a staff that's got like teeth on it. Yeah, he doesn't have a lot of the way, way of options either, but super cool, really interesting model. Some of them I may think about trying to use as actually like a piece in a game, but there's also a really good chance I might not, and I might just, you know, go with these guys. So they had a special if you bought three and you got a discount, and it was free shipping, and I was just like, okay, so I did it. And I'm, I'm, really, I'm really looking forward to, to, to trying them out because I think they're going to be great. Um, it's going to be challenging to paint, but I'm really looking forward to giving it a try because I am starting to think a little bit more. I'm, pr I'm never going to enter a, 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 a contest. But I am thinking a little bit more about trying to become a little bit more of a display painter, even if it's just for myself. You know what I mean? So anyway, so that is my bring back. This is what I have brought back from Adepticon. Um, well, except those guys. Those guys aren't here yet. But I did get a shipping thing like yesterday saying they've been shipped. So that's it. Um, no, I didn't buy a pony. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Matthew Sears says that, warning, their site has a lot of taters. I'm not, I, I know what he's, yes. All right. Um, and that's true, which is why I only showed you the ones that I bought. Um, they do have a lot of different models and stuff like that. Some of them are lady type models, lady demons, and you know, you can kind of figure out where that's going. And I didn't buy any of those. So yeah, but the, the, the models look great. Um, like I said, I bought a lot of stuff when I was at Adepticon and, um, a lot of it is terrain that, frankly, you can't find, you know, like at your local store generally. Like, you may have a local store that has some old um, armor cast, so you got that going for you, which is awesome. But, like, you, I don't even know if you can buy... I, armor cast still has a website, but it's just nice to be able to see that stuff up close, I think. Um, and then, you know, the 3D printed stuff and a lot of the other stuff. Like, you can't get those... Um, ruined like village corners from battlefield in the box gale force 9 doesn't sell them like they're gonna eventually they said but they only bring them to shows they brought it to them they brought them to gen con and they brought them to adepticon but you still can't get them from their website i don't know why they say they're going to be doing it soon but they haven't yet so hopefully soon they will end up on the website but we'll see so yeah anyway that's that's the stuff that i that i i, I bought at adepticon and uh, i've been saving up so that i could you know, get some good terrain. That was my kind of my main plan. I wanted to not like buy new games, buy a lot of new models. Uh, you know, I bought the Fishman and, and that kind of stuff, but I didn't want to buy a bunch of like new stuff. I want to sort of focus on the games that I'm currently focusing on. Um, but there were a lot of people there. There was a lot of vendors. There was a lot of the vending area was very robust this year, and it was great to see a lot of people you know, buying stuff. And, and I talked to a bunch of different vendors who were like, yeah, I, I broke even on my booth Thursday morning, you know, or Thursday afternoon or, or Friday. So that's always really nice. So, yeah. All right. John Patrick says, Creature Caster has some impressive sculpts. I just wish they did something other than Chaos Demons. I don't know if they're doing it because there's like a gap in the market and that's why they do the, the Chaos Demons or if it's just that the sculptor is just like that's his or her 
kind of area, his or her wheelhouse. That's what they're that's what they're interested in. That's what they're good at. Because um, I think the person who's doing it is good at it. Um, I think I met the guy who's the main sculptor, but I'm not 100% sure if it was him. I mean, I met people there, but I, I believe, um, yeah, it was, it, it's neat, it's neat stuff. Um, let's see here. What else have we got? How about showing a video of the massive collection of unopened miniatures that you mentioned in your hoarding video? Yeah, that would be a long video. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to get through that stuff too, and, or sell some of it. So that's, yeah, maybe not. Um, Matthew Sears says, I want to put a jacket on those lady demons. They're, they look, some of them look cold. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> um, let me see here. Total Noob says, you are making me regret I walked away without getting terrain, LOL. Uh, yeah, terrain, like I said, that's one of the big things that I like to, to see at Adepticon is uh, either terrain. Um, there were several companies that were also selling like, you know, the, like the neoprene mats or the vinyl mats. I stopped by and talked to Mario from Mats by Mars. And uh, um, I think that we're going to, at work, we're going to order one of his like more role-playing type mats, you know, where it's got like a one-inch squares on it and you can draw on it with a wet erase marker and stuff like that. But it kind of looks like a big piece of parchment, you know. But then it's got the squares on it and everything like that. Um, so yeah, I, that's we're just trying to figure out which size because he had a bunch of sizes in stock, but we weren't sure which size we wanted yet uh, for work. So we're looking at that. But yeah, Randall says any demo games at Adepticon? Yes, there were a lot of there were a lot of demo games going on there. Um, there were. Like in the main hallway, there was a bunch of demo games. There's a lot of demo games going on out in some of the other big areas. But um, I don't know. Like this year, some more of the demo games, not all, but some of the demo games did seem to be in the like in the vendor hall. The big all halls that had like lots of gaming going on, there wasn't as much in the way of vending because there were, or, or, sorry, demoing because there was so much tournament, you know, going on. I'm kind of hoping that in the future, I'd love to see them have just a demo area that's just just designed for that um they kind of move things around a little bit they used to have a little bit more of a demo area so there was like the vending area in one one of the bigger halls it's like modular they can kind of separate it there was like demo area vending area and then on both sides was like tournament like like x-wings slash other stuff on one side and then like 40k and stuff like that on the other side this year, the vending area expanded more, and I think that the demo area maybe suffered a touch because of that. Or you got to move someplace else that I just didn't find it particularly. That's possibly the case as well. I know there was demo stuff listed in the program, the online program, but uh, I just didn't come across as much of it this year, I felt. so. Um, but there was a lot of cool stuff going on that I did get to see. Like There was a big, huge Shadespire tournament. I guess it was like 130 people. Or something along those lines on Thursday, Thursday or Friday night. Um, so that that was really cool. I watched some of that and, and talked to some people that I knew who were playing that. So yeah, definitely. Five twenty one Wallace says, "Are you still building a Primaris army?" I'm currently not building it. It's built. Uh, I've got a two thousand point Primaris army. They are built. They are textured, like their bases and stuff like that. They have uh, fancy shoulder pad markings, like the three D printed. Uh, Shapeways, sh shoulder pad stuff. I've glued that on all the dudes. Uh, and even special vehicle markings and things like that, also from uh, Shapeways, like the three-dimensional stuff. And they are ready to be primed. Um, I have purchased the primer, the airbrush primer, and I'm just basically waiting to not be traveling so that I can sit down and do it. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, my plan is to sit down and start just airbrushing away on those guys and trying to get as many of them primed as possible. The 2,000 point Primaris army is surprisingly small in number. Like the way that 8th edition has changed things is that like a 2,000 point, you know, army was a decent amount of models back in the day, unless you were like something super elite, like maybe Grey Knights. Um, now, even my Primaris, it's still only like overall 32 models or something like that. Uh, which is not a ton, you know what I mean? Um, admittedly, one of them is a repulsor tank, so he's you know, big, and one of them is a redemptor dreadnought, which is also big, uh, but everything else is pretty much just Primaris guys, so yeah. 
Matthew Sears says it's hard to demo in those big halls. That's true. That's very true. It's one of the reasons that the um, the demos for um, for wreckage are out in the main kind of walkway hallway. It's a bit quieter because not everybody's in there all at once. So that's that's a good thing. Do you think Adepti Adept yeah, excuse me, Bob asks, do you think Adepticon has outgrown their current venue? That's the impression I got from going from the last eight years. Um, I don't know if they've outgrown it quite yet. I think that if they want to keep growing the convention, they're at a point maybe where it's going to become difficult at this particular place. The problem is, is there's not a lot of bigger places in the area. Like if you start moving into Chicago, prices then go through the roof. Um, and that's going to be difficult. So yeah, I'm not sure how that's going to work, but um, I know that they're they're already thinking about you know or trying to figure out what they're going to do. This is not a this is not a group who just sits back and goes, yeah, no, we should probably think about that in a couple of years. They're very proactive, um, Hank and Matthias and all the rest of the guys. So um, yeah, definitely, I would say that uh, I know that they've got plans. Uh, I don't know what they are, but I know that they've got plans. Um, hmm. Jesse says, regarding demos, Fantasy Flight should have more demo space for Legion, as that was always fill, uh, full when I when I looked. W with Legion just coming out on Thursday of the convention, like, Legion launched on Thursday during the convention. So, um, yeah, I could see a bunch of people who were probably like, I want to try this out before I pull the trigger on buying it. Like I said, I originally thought when they announced, oh, hey, the launch date is the 22nd of May or March. And I was like, oh, it's an, interestingly, that's the first day of Adepticon. It's weird for it to be a Thursday. Um, I just assumed they were going to put a copy in everybody's swag bag, and they didn't, which was interesting. Because um, they did last year with uh, Rune Wars. But, and Rune Wars wasn't even out yet. Like, it was, Rune Wars wasn't in stores for another three weeks or whatever, but everybody at Adepticon who had a swag bag got a copy of Rune Wars. They did not do that with Legion. Um, somebody I talked to said they suspected it might have something to do with Disney, which is potentially true. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. J Tick says, man, after playing an event at Gen Con for Star Wars Legion, the game is just awful. The balance is way off right now. Maybe down the line it will balance out, but man, it's just not a solid system. Um, yeah, I... Like I said, I've watched some demos. I haven't played them, but I've watched some demos, and i watched some bat reps. The thing that surprises me is that there's really just the two factions, which I guess kind of makes sense with the story, but it's sort of difficult. Um, and I've heard there, there are some balance problems. Yeah, definitely. Blake says, Adam, care to talk about the orc rock and roll band? So out in the main hallway, uh, like kind of where you get from like the lobby and the... the, the actual hotel -y part to the convention center -y part there's this long hallway and um there's like concessions out there mini wargaming had a booth out there wreckage had a demo area out there and there was also an orc rock band out there called the Goff rockers i believe and uh, so it was guys who dressed up like orcs and had like orc heads and the orc and played i i never heard them play specifically they've been around for a while because i want to say that they gave me a cd uh, like years ago, they were just handing not, not just me, they were handing out CDs. Um, but I think that that yeah, or else you had to buy it. Maybe I bought one. I somewhere in the basement there's a there's a there's a CD that's got orcs on it. Um, so yeah, that was interesting. I don't know if they did a show at some point, someplace, or if they just sat there. There was like a guy who sat on a drum kit, and every once in a while would like hit it a little bit, but it was not like like my concern was they were going to just start playing in the hallway, like right next to where everybody else was trying to do their thing, and that was going to be problematic. I didn't hear that, so um, maybe at some point when I was gone, they did play a show down there in that hallway, but I didn't come across it. So um, They looked, you know, orcs are beefy, uh, and these guys had, like, those kind of suits that you put on that tries to make you look like you're a little more buff than you are, but they still looked kind of skinny, you know, as orcs go. So, uh, but, you know, it was cool. I mean, I, the guy, they had cool boots, like orc, their, their orc shoes looked very orcish, so that was cool. Um, let's see, did you see, uh, Jonathan Westmoreland says, Adam, did you see the game that Parabellum was demoing? Um, I saw it actually at Adepticon, and I talked a little bit to one of the guys there, and I also originally talked to them at Gamma. Parab I, I posted some pictures actually from Gamma, a couple weeks, three weeks back, or whatever it was now. 
uh, I posted pictures of the Parabellum models, which is a game called Conflict. I think it's called Conflict. But the name of the company is Parabellum, and they're making some really interesting models, which are going to be in stores, I believe, in June. So, yeah, take a look at some of that stuff. They, It was really interesting. Like, the models are super cool looking. Like I said, if you go check out my Instagram, you can find them there. Um, and they had a great looking display board where they were showing stuff off. They were running short little tiny demos, like on a little two by two board in their booth to kind of show you. Um, I don't know that it's gonna be a game for me specifically. Like I could see using those models for other stuff. And the thing that's cool about it too is they put the models on round bases, but the game is designed to be rank and flank. So then you put the round bases into square inserts and then you move the guys you know, in those trays. But the reason they put them into the round the reason they put round into square, because I asked him, I'm like, so if it's a rank and flank game, why are they on round bases? He's like, because then when you put them into the square or the rectangular trays with the circle inserts, you can put them in there and turn them so they all fit. One of the issues always with the old Warhammer Fantasy is that you had to try to, when you were putting your guys together, you had to sort of be like, oh no, this guy always has to go on the far left because he's got a spear that sticks out funny and so then he'll poke another guy in the face and so I have to kind of, and it was almost like a puzzle putting them all together. With this setup, you put the models into the trays and then you can just turn them all slightly so nobody's poking anybody in the eye or whatever, which is a smart idea. I am not necessarily a fan of the rank and flank style gameplay, so it's not something that's gonna speak to me, but the models do look awesome and like I said, I could see maybe using them for something else, um, which is cool. But yeah, they're, uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting um, interesting set of models, absolutely, and uh, an interesting world from what I've seen of the the stuff you know in there on their website and everything like that. Um, hmm. Scathe Zombie says Empire is much stronger than Rebels at the moment. Well, I mean, you know, they sort of should be a little bit, but uh, I got something bug in my eye. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I know they've got a bunch of kicking plastic bags. I know they've got a bunch of the stuff at my local shop. Um, you know, they bought into all the stuff that was released or whatever. And I know they've sold some, but I don't, it's not flown off the shelves. So, but we'll see. Um, I know a lot of people were playing it, uh, you know, like in the demos and things like that. Adepticon, it was difficult to get a demo from what I understand. So there was that, but yep. Um... Conquest, not, yeah, not Conflict. The game, the Parabellum game is called Conquest. That makes a lot more sense. Uh, Kelly says, hey, Tabletop Minions, great seeing you there. Thanks for the selfie. Uh, absolutely, Kelly, it was good to meet you. Um, yeah, I, I think um, Craziest Selfie Award, and I cannot, I'm just terrible with names, and I can't remember his name. He was at the meetup on Saturday night, and he took, uh, he took a picture I think I have a picture on my phone, which is going to be hard to show you. But uh, he took uh, a selfie with me, or actually a couple, uh, and uh, it was um, not a Polaroid, but it was made by a company, I think, called Fuji. But they're like basically instant photos. So there's me and him. And uh, these are just pictures that came out of the camera that we put onto the, uh, that I then put on the table. Um, I don't think, they're not, it's not super in focus for some reason. Anyway, but yeah, so um, I told the story I think last show about how uh, a, a viewer wanted to get a, a picture with me uh, at Gamma and used the webcam on his laptop and then the two of us got in that picture um, and so this one is now I think the new unique uh, thing because you don't see a lot of uh, you don't see a lot of uh, instant cameras like that anymore in the days of digital photography which is even more instant Uh, what else have we got here? Got to talk about Star Wars. The Goff Rockers do not have their own website, from what I can tell, and I don't know anything about those metal hosting these metal hosting sites, says Matthew. But they have a Facebook page, evidently. So you know, if you're into orc rock, um, then you can check them out on Facebook, evidently. Uh, what else have we got here? Wizard World is still held at, and Stephen Ambrose Center, another new name though, and it's over 70,000 right now, says J Tick. Wizard World is a big comic book convention, um, and it's at the Stephen Ambrose Center, which I think is in downtown Chicago ish, maybe? I don't know a ton. That, I know that sounds familiar. The reason that I've heard about, the, the problem I've heard about trying to move Adepticon downtown is that 
housing then becomes incredibly expensive and difficult. So um, then we get into basically Gen Con issues. So I don't want to go there, but we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah. Uh, a lot of people are talking about the Legion demo game that comes in the box is super unbalanced. It's about 70 point difference. Adding upgrades a la X-Wing or playing a full game is better. Okay, makes sense. From what I've heard, like the starter box is not, like, you, you know, if you just take the starter box contents and fight against each other, yeah, that's not super balanced. And you generally need to buy two starter boxes or, you know, maybe some of the expansion stuff or whatever. But yeah. I could see that. Um, hmm. What else have we got? Hmm. Uh, at least on my end, things have. What are we doing here? Some sort of lag issue, it looks like. That's fun. There it comes back. Okay. Um, did you get a chance to play the new version of Wild West Exodus? My local friendly game store owner and I have been having a ton of fun with it and getting a few people into it. Uh, I did not get a chance to. I did see it a bunch, and there were there were people in the booth pretty frequently. I don't know if there was a demo they were doing in the booth. I know at Gen Con, definitely, because they had a huge setup there at Gen Con. This year, at, at, at um, Adepticon, they had a slightly smaller booth, but, you know, there's not huge booths necessarily like there are at Gen Con, just because it's not as, as big as a place. But um, it's still, they, 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 they did, okay. did okay. They had at least, I think, two booths pushed together. And, uh, yeah, I don't know if they were running demos out of it or not. Hmm. I did not play one, though. Um, oh, no, wait. I, wait, I was I was standing and talking to... They were running demos. Yes, because I was standing and talking to Jay Tick and uh, another guy we know, Adam. And, uh, yeah, and so we were sitting there, and um, I was watching them get a demo on a little, like, two-by-two. Two. That's right. They were running demos for that. Unless that was a different game, and I'm completely confused. But I'm pretty sure that was... Um, that was definitely Wild West Exodus. Almost. Almost almost totally sure. Uh, Voing Gapon. I'm totally missing that one. I apologize right in advance. Looks like a Fuji Instant Max. Yes. Or Instant Instax Mini. Yeah, that was the, the little instant camera. Uh, it was bright blue. Um, but yeah, that was kind of fun. Frankie Lee Bailey says, TMX gaming rig PC selfies. I don't, you don't need to bring your gaming rig to the, the, the TMX. There's, I don't, I mean, there's places you can plug it in, I guess, but. Uh, yeah. DJ Todd P. Harris says, what date is Origins? Uh, it's in mid-June. I don't remember the date off the top of my head. Might be the 13th to the 17th? I'm not 100% sure. Yep. Um, yeah. I haven't been to Origins since 1995, so I'm sure it's a bit different now than it was back then. I'm sure the whole area is uh, uh, different. So yeah, definitely. Matthew Phillips says, did GW talk about Kill Team? Uh, not a lot, frankly. They showed off that same video that we've all seen, and some people asked if it was... I mean, it, they've already said it's going to be standalone, but they didn't really, you know, go past that. Somebody, I think, asked if there was going to be specific models just for Kill Team, and I don't think they really said yes. They were kind of... They were real quiet about Kill Team. I mean, they showed the video and they were like, yeah, Kill Team's coming and that's great and all that stuff. But they didn't really particularly say 100% when. They didn't say what it was going to be like. Um, it was kind of interesting. I'm, I'm still sort of surprised what they're doing with that. Um, and so I did have a talk with uh, the guy that I talk, deal with at, at Games Workshop generally. And um, I told him that, you know, when they were going to launch it or whatever, I was he and I were going to need to have a conversation because I would like to... You know, if he could send me a copy early and then I could take a look at it and talk to you guys about it and all that kind of stuff, um, like we did with Shadespire, like we did with Necromunda, that kind of jazz. Um, so, yeah, he was like, yeah, we'll definitely be doing that. But I don't know exactly when it's going to launch. So, um, he, I don't know, think, I'm not even 100% sure he had the, the information yet either. So, yeah, there's that. <clears throat> so, yeah, that was pretty much, they talked about a lot of different things and they, Sort of touched on Kill Team, but not as much as I would have liked, frankly. Um, do, 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 do. Was there a lot of gamer funk this year? I didn't smell anything. I generally, like Gen Con, I smell a lot more. Like, I walk through some odors from time to time, 
at at Gen Con, but it's also in the Indianapolis in in August. I mean, that's warm, you know. Uh, Adepticon, you know, Schaumburg in March is not nearly as hot. So uh, yeah, it's I didn't have any problems like that this year at all. Now that you mention it, I don't remember smelling anything that was untoured. Um, yeah. Got some more. Uh, we've got some more people talking about different places to have the event if it needs to go someplace. The Donald Steffen Center, the new name of the Stephen Ambrose Rosemont Center, is in Rosemont, Illinois. So it's outside of downtown, but it's going to be more expensive. The McCormick Center is downtown. Yeah, I've heard about the McCormick Center before. I think I think I've been there for something years and years and years ago. And yeah, it's big and it's huge, but it's also going to be super crazy expensive. Uh, Johannes asks, did they say anything about Sisters of Battle? Well, yes, they did. They said that Plastic Sisters are coming in 2019, which got a big reaction, you know. Well, here's the deal. They didn't say, oh, it's coming in, em in 2019. They said, Emperor willing, it's coming in 2019, Plastic Sisters, which is a little weird to me. I'm like, what do you mean, Emperor willing? Like, is there a reason that it might slip? Why? What? Anyway. I think that they just, I don't know, I think partially they just like to tease a little bit. I don't know what it is, but uh, hopefully, they, they didn't show off any pictures or anything like that. They don't have anything ready to go from what I remember, but they did say that what they do plan on doing with the Sisters of Battle, these new Plastic Sisters, and this is very different than anything they've ever done in the past, they're going to be showing like preliminary designs and getting feedback and then coming up with like the next round of, so... Rather than just being like, here it is, it's done, ta-da, and you're like, okay, cool, uh, you know, wet elves, or whatever. Instead, they're going to be like, well, we're thinking about going like this, and then people will say a bunch of stuff, and they'll be like, all right, so we'll, and so they're going to, which is a very different process for Games Workshop. They've never asked our opinion about what we think about a model before they release it, and so that's going to be kind of interesting. Whether they actually do anything with the information or not, who's to say, but um it's going to be a different process than pretty much anything else they've ever done before is what they were trying to get the point across, which I think is kind of interesting, definitely. <clears throat> uh, Philip says he picked up uh, Wild West Exodus after a demo. The rules are a little keyword heavy, but once you have it figured out, it's pretty smooth. Downside is they are repack old minis with new sculpts, so the options feel limited. I remember seeing the original sculpts, uh, when they first did the original Kickstarter, back when Battle Foam was technically the company that made Wild West Exodus. And uh, I always thought the sculpts were kind of cool. I mean, they were sometimes a little static, but I thought they were what they, they were like, like the shapes were very well done, but sometimes the poses were not as exciting. I don't know. Maybe it's, I think it maybe just sometimes, sometimes when you just see the 3D renders, it's, they don't, they look a little bit more flat. You know what I mean? Which doesn't make any sense, but there it is. Um, yeah, so I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I don't know anybody around here who's playing it currently, but I do know that, um, like I said, they've had a big booth at Gen Con. They had a decent-sized booth here at... Um, yeah, because now that I'm thinking about it, I, I'm i thinking of a different company when I was thinking about that smaller booth. They had like an end cap kind of bigger booth, and they had three demo stations. I think I was thinking of Knuckle Dusters, which is another... Uh, like Wild West type game, they had a smaller booth that was maybe only two booths, and I was getting them confused. Um, hmm, parking in Chicago would be ridiculous, $35 a day. Yeah, that would be a definite issue. To be fair, though, the parking at Adepticon is also kind of tough. It doesn't, it's not expensive, but like getting there on Wednesday, I parked the car because there was a space, and then people would be like, hey, we could go like to this restaurant or we could drive over there, and I'm like, I don't want to move the car on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, because I will then there will be no place to park when I come back. So, um, yeah, it's one of those deals where, at least for me, at least at Adapticon, I either eat in one of the restaurants upstairs, which are lovely, frankly. Like, there's a place there, a super fancy restaurant, I think, in there called Sam and Harry's, I think it's called, which if you go there for dinner is not cheap at all. But if you go there for lunch, it's surprisingly reasonable. Um, and it's better than the concession food by a good deal and nearly the same price like just like a buck more than concession food but way better anyway my point is is that um yeah i don't know it's uh it's something that, that I, I don't like to go to restaurants around adepticon during adepticon because i'm there at adepticon for adepticon you know what i mean 
And so that's one of the reasons, besides the fact that I don't want to lose my parking space, it's one of the reasons I don't usually leave. So we bring snacks and food and we eat there in the building and it's fine. Phillips says, my wife says, bring Adepticon to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You know, it's not a terrible idea. I'm a fan of that. Um, Kelly asks, what are your top three games at the moment? What are you playing the most when you play? Uh, right now, it's probably uh, Shadespire, Age of Sigmar, and Wreckage. Um, well, yeah. Yeah, I've played more. Sh I've played more Age of Sigmar than I have played 40k recently. Since the new editions come out, I've only played 40k a couple of times because I'm working on a new army. Like my Chaos Army for Ages or for um, my Chaos Army for 40k is painted up to 1500 points. I've got some stuff on my painting table to get it up to 2000. That's almost. That's like halfway done. Um, then maybe I'll play a couple more Age of Sigmar games for a bit. Uh, or, sorry, I mean 40k games. But otherwise, it's been Age of Sigmar, um, Shadespire, which is really kind of a gateway game. If you're talking about just straight miniatures games, then I don't know that I would call Shadespire a straight miniatures game. But I've been playing a bunch of it lately. It's a lot of fun. It's quick and easy, too, which is nice. Um, yeah, but I'm hoping to, like I said, start playing some more 40k. And then uh, I need to finish up my um, arc troopers for wreckage and then play some more of that uh one of my friends at work he also picked up um stakers i think he picked up a, a, some stakers so um yeah and he's already got reclaimers and drifters i know he's got reclaimers i've seen his reclaimers they're nice i can't remember if he's got drifters or not like painted but anyway um oh geez uh the chat moved Sorry, I've got a thing going on with my eye over here. Um, X72821 says, I parked every day. It took 15 to 20 minutes to find parking if you arrive after 8 a.m. Yeah, no, I can see that. It, like I said, the parking is difficult. Um, Riot54 says, regarding 3D renders, it depends on how good the lighting is. In the lighting in the render is poor lighting makes them look very flat. No, I could totally see that. That totally makes sense. Plus, I always do like a really just like a flat gray color, and yeah, I don't know. VJ Morph, hey VJ, uh, hey Adam, did you get sent of some of the Artis Opus brushes? No, I did not. I've I just recently saw a thumbnail on YouTube of something about artist opus brushes. I've not heard of them. I thought it was a mistype because there's no T on the end. I would I would think it would be artist opus brushes, but it's not evidently because you're also spelling it that way unless both of you have, been, have uh, made a typo. I've not heard of them or anything like that, so I don't know anything about them. Uh, Josh McCarthy says, I used lift a few times to save my spot. See, that's not a bad idea. I could have done that. We could have gone and taken a lift someplace to get like other food but again then you're off site more and i i want to like you know be more on site talk to more people see more stuff that's one of the reasons i go to adepticon um except when i'm in the hotel room drinking whiskey with uh moderator matt here as as he has mentioned J Tick says that adepticon could move to wisconsin the midwest express center or whatever its current name is could hold it well it does an anime con in milwaukee which is larger and had two hotels connected yeah i mean midwest express center or whatever it is called now i don't remember actually um that used to be where Gen Con was at the very end before it moved to Indianapolis. So, yeah, I would definitely think that would be something they could think about. I don't know if they want to move to Milwaukee for reasons, because they all kind of, uh, most of the people who work on Adepticon live in the, the, the Illinois area. So there's that, but it's a potential idea. It would be probably cheaper than moving it into certain parts of Chicago, but I don't know that for sure. Like the Rosemont area might be a different thing, but... I am having coffee. Okay, there we go. Um, what do you think about busts? I've never painted one. Um, there was a bunch of them in the Crystal Brush this year, and I know people who really enjoy doing that. I don't know, because the thing about painting a bust is that you're focusing a ton on just, like, the face. 
And I don't personally think that I'm super great at faces yet, so I don't know that I want to go down that road. Eventually, at some point, I might, after maybe doing some of these creature caster guys and that kind of stuff, I might actually be like, oh, yeah, you know, what I should do is I should uh, maybe start painting busts and doing that. But for me, busts are like... Yeah, I don't know. Like, busts are like portrait, portrait photography. They seem simple. You know, there's not usually a bunch of fancy lighting effects that you need, you know, OSL and that kind of stuff that you're going to do on a bust. It's just like, oh, it's just a face. You just paint a face. But that's hard. Just like portrait photography is hard. Taking a picture of a person, okay, yeah. Just painting a bust, yeah. But doing it really well on either situation, I think, is very difficult. And so that's probably not something that I'm going to be doing anytime soon. Um like I said, I'm just starting now to dip my toe into display style um, paint. So we'll see how that works out. But that's something I didn't, I did not really buy any paint while I was at Adepticon this year. I stopped by the Scale 75 booth and they were super busy and I was going to come back later and then I totally forgot to. Hmm. Trap. Well, uh, I did get a whole bunch of, uh, where is it? Right here. This was not at Adepticon. This was at Gamma. But I got a whole bunch of, um, Paint from, again, plastic bag noises, sorry. Uh, secret weapon. Um, I've got, uh, these are, yeah, this is uh, engine fluid color. Um, this is dark iron. Um, yeah, yeah, secret weapon has made washes for quite some time, which are technically actually glazes, which I've mentioned before. But, ooh, and there's, a, there's an agitator in there too, nice. Um, but they've started their own line of kind of like they started their own line of like condition paints like rust and 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 um weathering style paints that was their first line now they've launched a line of mecca style paints and they've even got another line of paints they've just released or are just about to release as well and i was going to stop by and look at some yeah see that's the thing you, you get so busy there's times when you're like oh yeah i'm gonna come back later when the booth isn't so busy and then you forget so um that's kind of difficult in my opinion Uh, Gianna, hey Gianna, says it would be difficult as the head of Adepticon lives downstate Illinois. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that is kind of the issue is if you have a convention that's, you know, five hours away or four hours away from where you live, that becomes very difficult. So, yeah. Um, Matthew Phillips, is any talk from the Frostgrave line? Uh, I saw the plastic kind of shipmen or shipmates, pirate basically models. Those were pretty cool. Um, Osprey's booth was had a lot of stuff going on this year. Um, there was a, a new Viking game being demoed there that uh, uh, a guy that I know named Tim is producing uh, or is writing for them, and he uh, was running demos of that most of the weekend. Um, Ash Barker from Gorilla Miniature Games, his YouTube channel, he wrote a game for them, which is uh, zombie adjacent in some fashion. And um, he was doing some demos of that there as well. Not the entire weekend, but a couple of different times I walked by, saw a bunch of people hanging out. So that was cool. They've got a lot going on at Osprey. Um, I like, I love Frostgrave, as you guys have known. Um, hmm. When Kelly was asking me four about top three, eh, Frostgrave is probably four, I would say, right now. Because uh, I just haven't played it as much lately, but yeah. But uh, Frostgrave was pretty cool, though. Definitely. Um, hey, Gavis Gaming is here. Cool. VJ Morph says, getting smooth blends on busts is hard as hell. Definitely not for the faint of heart. Yeah, which is one of the reasons also why I wanted to take uh, the layering for smoothness class that I took with Sam Lenz at Adepticon. We painted um, power swords, and uh, I did learn some things. Absolutely. Um, just about, it's very interesting. Once you get like, and I'm nowhere near it yet. But once you get really good at painting, it's no longer just like, oh, I just put paint on the model. There's definite, like, the way that you do the paint stroke is also very important. Doing the layering that we were doing, it's a lot about, so if, and this is going to be, okay, so if this was a sword, let's just pretend it's a sword, and you're, and, it, and like, it's half and half because it's, you know, like, so you're trying to paint on the sword, and so you've painted it all like a turquoise color, and now you're trying to oh, on this side, you're trying to make a you're trying to make it fade from turquoise, which is the base color, up to say like a lighter color, like a super light blue or even maybe a white. When you're doing that, your brush is going on, and you don't you can't just go like okay, I'm just going to paint 
you know you have to, you have to kind of go the direction because as you go as you're laying the, the the stroke down you're actually putting when you end there's more paint here than there is at the beginning of the stroke as the stroke goes along the surface now you're actually even pulling the paint with you and that helps to kind of give it a bit of a gradient so you're using very thin down paints and you're starting here and going from like you're with your just light just slightly lighter than the, than the base color and then you're going here and you're laying that dry and you're kind of doing it a couple times and then you add a little more white to it instead of starting here now you're starting here and doing it and then you add even some more white and now instead of starting here you're starting here and just doing it and you're kind of trying to build that gradient but you can't go the other direction because it will completely screw up the gradient it's all about which way the brush is going you know the brush strokes themselves become very important as you get into that kind of fancier stuff. Now, in general, I will be perfectly honest, if I'm going to do a power sword, I'm probably just going to use an airbrush because for me, it's way quicker. But airbrushes don't always work. Like on the swords that we were actually doing it on, they were not straight swords that were completely symmetrical. They were, um, I think they're called falchions. And usually they're carried by um, gray knights, I want to say. And so it's like a sword that goes up and then the top one part curves okay so it's got like a rounded tip but not like rounded this way it's like one side goes straight and the other side goes this that's really hard to do with an air whoa i got out of focus there that's really hard to do with an airbrush um not impossible but it's harder to do so in those situations it's better to use a brush but just understanding how to do that layering um if you figure out like wet blending and layering and you start to practice that and go you can really do some interesting things um, you can get a lot more smooth with your paint jobs. It takes longer, but you don't do it on your tabletop stuff that you're just using to play. You, you do it on the things that you want to look really good, specific HQ type units, display stuff, those kinds of things. So it's really interesting. Um, Gaddis Gaming says, are you going to start playing Dark Age because of the two-player starter box giveaway? Uh, no. I mean, I've played Dark Age. I have an army a small warband or whatever they're called uh, for Dark Age. I've got Core, the robot dudes. Um, and I really enjoyed the models and I put them together and painted them and I'll have to put some like good pictures up one of these days. I don't have any. Uh, there's some on my phone, but you're not going to see them very easily. Anyway, um, I liked the models quite a bit and I've heard that these new models are also super cool. But at the time, unless they've changed things drastically, I just didn't like the rule set, you know? Like, the storyline's kind of cool, and um, although they seem to be moving away from the storyline a lot, too, there's just a lot of kind of crazy stuff going on, and it's just not... I'm kind of an outsider looking in on it and also not particularly enjoying the actual rule set. So, yeah, I don't see myself doing that. So, you know, sorry. Ebb and Flow says, uh, Speaking of zombie adjacent, I saw the movie you and Sam were in re uh, recently. Imagine my surprise. Yeah, um... Yeah, Sam and I were in a movie uh, back in 2010, I think, is when it was originally produced. Um, it's a game, or it's a game, it's a movie called Dead Weight, and you can find it, I believe you can watch it for free on Amazon Prime. And it's kind of a zombie movie, but without any zombies in it. Um, Sam's in it a bit more than I am. I'm only in like the last quarter of the movie for a bit. Um, but yeah, it was a fun movie. It was fun to, it was fun to work on. Um, yeah. So if you're, if you got Amazon prime or if you go onto eBay, uh, you can probably find the movie for about three bucks on like DVD. Uh, but it's called dead weight and, um, it's a zombie apocalypse kind of style movie, but it was a lot of fun. It was filmed like right around here. So yeah, it was cool. Uh, let me see here. What else? Marketing Tidbits asks, what do you think about the Idaneth Deepkin? Uh, wet elves. They are wet elves. And I'm not a big fan of elves, so they're not my jam. Um, there's a lot of people who are happy about them, and that's cool. I'm glad for them. Um, I know that uh, like some of those big turtles and dolphins and all the weird stuff that they're riding on. Like The sculpts are cool. But the aesthetic doesn't speak to me, so and I like I said, I'm I'm not pro elf. So um, yeah, I was really hoping for for fishmen. I was really hoping for fish people, scaly bug eyes, um, webbed, clawed, you know that whole thing. Um, what turns out that what well, we didn't get it. 
Phil Morris asks, did you check out Judgment at Adepticon Fantasy 54 MOBA-style miniatures game? Very impressive sculpts. I walked past the table several times. I did not stop. Um, I, the models were cool. I, I just didn't... I, I don't play MOBAs, so I'm like, well, that's not for me, that's not a selling point. You know what I mean? But the models look kind of cool. Um, I don't generally like big, really big models like that for gaming, just because then it th i got to come up with a whole new scale for terrain, and that drives me a little nuts, so... Um, what else? Speaking of airbrushing, I need to get painting. I have 30 buildings I need to paint for a bolt action event in Chicago on Saturday. Oh, on this upcoming Saturday. Well, you better get moving then. Um, I would tell you airbrush is probably the way to go. Definitely. Uh, you want to get moving on that. Yeah. I mean, unless you don't have to like work any at all this week. If you just got this whole week off, then eh, you can probably pull it off. But otherwise, you're going to be busy. Uh, Llama Juice. Just started a red armored squad of stormtroopers. An airbrush would be so much easier for this. Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, airbrush is, like, it's the greatest if you for, for, for priming, in my opinion. Although, for terrain, I do generally still like Rattle Can because it can be quicker. And also because a lot of times if you've got, like, it can stick maybe a little bit better. It's hard to say. One of the downsides to all of this resin that I showed you in the beginning part of the show is it all needs to be washed. You need to, for resin, you need to put it into like a bucket of water with just a touch, maybe just a touch of like like washing, dishwashing detergent or something like that. And then you kind of need to scrub everything, not real super hard, but sort of quickly with a, a, like, a like an old toothbrush. Do not use your current toothbrush. It's not a good idea, but use an old toothbrush or a new toothbrush that you aren't planning on putting in your mouth. And then, because you, there's, the molds for resin stuff, it's kind of rubbery, and then they sprinkle this stuff inside that's all like a powder. And it's kind of like, you know, when you're baking cookies and you spray Pam, or whatever it's called, on the cookie sheet, so you can actually get the cookies off of the damn sheet. Uh, same kind of thing. When you are, uh, you need to sprinkle this stuff in there so that when you want to open the thing, the mold, to get, it's called mold release, you can pop out the actual thing, and it doesn't stick to the mold. But then it's this powdery stuff is very frequently, or sometimes it's even a fluid, is stuck then to the model. And then when you try to paint it, then the paint just flakes off because it's got nothing to stick to because that's the whole point. So you need to get that junk off, the mold release stuff off. So it's an extra step, but the resin stuff usually looks so good that I don't kind of care. You know, what you do is like first first step, wash a bunch of it, lay it out on a towel to dry, let it air dry. Next step, start to prime it and go from there. Yes. Um, Deepkin are evil elves, or are they just shellfish? Whoa, that's that's <laughs> that's that's good. Uh, I don't know if they're good or bad. Um, uh, some of them might be a little shellfish, though. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, Valhalla in the fall has been fully funded. Looking forward to meeting you there. Hey, Dave. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll be there. Um, I've uh, purchased my airplane ticket, so I'm on my on my way there. I mean, not right now. It's in the fall, but you, yeah. Um, there you go. Do you think that Games Workshop will go for an Age of Sigmar sea theme and release of bug-eyed sea dweller, maybe even swamp people? I think that would be awesome. I also think that would be awesome. I don't think they will do it, sadly. I would love to see some fish people, as I have mentioned, but uh, it doesn't seem like they're going to go that way. I mean, uh, well, no, probably not. Like, what we're seeing for the the, the pictures they've been showing on Warhammer Community website uh, are probably going to be... Well, like, look at a lot of the other releases recently. Like, look at the uh, the Sky El or the Sky Dwarves or whatever, the Caradon Overlords. Um, like, they released a whole bunch of stuff all at once. And they're like, ta-da, and they haven't released anything since. And I have a suspicion they'll probably do that again with the Deepkin... Um, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like a thing where they'll release some, and then six months later they'll release even a bit more, and then release some more. It, there may be a trickle afterwards, but that's probably about it. Charles says, hey, Adam, good to see you again at Depticon. What kind of airbrush do you use? I went to Ken Badger's class and ordered one of his Patriot 105s. Um, I own a, I own two. I own uh, an Iowata Eclipse, uh, yeah, uh, HPCS, I think, is what it, the, the technical, what, what, what the model number. And I own an Iowata Neo, which is a cheaper brush, which I predominantly use for varnishing and stuff like that. Um, 
I like those fine. I like those great. Uh, I never, like, for whatever reason, I, well, here's why. I bought those from my local Hobby Lobby, and they didn't carry um, Badger. So I've never used a Badger brush myself, but um, I just used the Iowata because it's what I could get locally. So, um, but I've always heard good things generally about, you know, Badger. Um, so, yeah. Uh Chicken Nug says, is airbrushing worth it? Yeah, I would say yes. Um, depending on where you live, like if you live someplace where it is always about 70 degrees Fahrenheit and never humid, yeah, well then stick with rattle can maybe. You know what I mean? Like, uh, But if you live anywhere in a place where it gets cold and you can't spray prime outside, um, then at the very least, giving an inexpensive airbrush just to do spray priming it saves you a ton of time and money. You can, like, I used to, before I had an airbrush, there would be, like, one, like, really nice warm day, like, in, like, early November or late October where I would rush outside and try to prime as much stuff so that I would have things to paint over the winter as possible. And now I can, it can be, you know, two degrees outside and a foot of snow, and I can just go in the basement and prime, like, one guy. And I'm not wasting a lot of paint with rattle can because, like, painting, like, one figure with rattle can, you're, you're spraying a lot more paint than you're actually using. With airbrush, you're just using a little bit, which is really nice. Um, and then that's, again, that's just priming. Then if you start getting into also doing some base coating, well, base coating is also very helpful for, for that. Um, and then if you want to start getting into highlighting and getting into lighting effects and doing all these other things, as you progress, you your airbrushing can get better and get more useful for you. So I'm a big fan of airbrushing, yes. Now, I don't generally like the super over the super airbrushed look, you know, where you go crazy with it and make everything a gradient and do all that kind of stuff. But if you're a little bit more subtle with it, I think it can make a, a super huge difference. Um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Uh, chicken Nugget says, or Chicken Nug, excuse me, is that starter set thing on Badger's website good? I'm not familiar with it, so I don't know. Torch says, uh, I have a Patriot 105. It's a great starter. So that's a, that's, that's a, a, a testimonial right there is what the word I was looking for. Um, yeah, so Total Noob says, I bought a Badger compressor at Adapticon. The price was like half the Amazon price. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, he Ken does usually do deals at Adepticon. Um, yeah, and and they've been making a lot more talking about priming. They have their own primer, their own airbrush primer called Steinal Res, which is a fun word to say, a hard word to spell though. Um, but Steinal Res, initially when it first came out, it was black, white, and gray, and that was it. Now there's tons of colors of Steinal Res, including chrome, which is not like shiny mirror chrome, but basically like a silver metallic. But a silver metallic primer. I mean, like if you're painting like an Imperial Knight, let's say, like I'm going to soon, like you just put most of them together except for the big armor panels, which you keep off and you just spray the entire damn thing silver basically as your primer. That's saving you a big step in my opinion. So yeah, definitely. I'm on board with that. I picked some of that up actually at uh, Gen Con. Yeah, I think it was Gen Con. Um... Fred Mulvaney says, Adam, does Sam have painting classes outside of Adepticon? Here and there, yes. I mean, he does have, you can contact him on his website, uh, which is samsonminis.blogspot.com. And he does do some stuff. I don't know if he's doing anything like Skype, but I think he is. I know he also does sometimes do some personal stuff. I did just see on his Facebook, he said that he was going to be teaching classes out on the West Coast sometime this year. So that's kind of cool, too. Um, he'll... As far as I know, he's going to be at uh, TMX. I need to shoot him. At a, I need to talk to him soon. We, we're going to be getting together and filming this month, I believe, in April. I just have to get the new studio kind of finished up, and then we're going to shoot here uh, in town because he lives like like every day when I go to work, I go to the city that he lives in. It's like 25 minutes away from here, uh, you know, by car. So we live pretty close to each other. So it's really easy for him to come here too for uh, the the shooting in the studio. Um, but yeah, we need to nail down. Uh, what he's going to do at uh, Tabletop Minions Expo at TMX, um, which he said he wants to go to, and hopefully he doesn't have something else he's doing, like going out to the West Coast. So I should need to, yeah, I'll have to make sure about that. Um, 
Badger compressor sounds like something which would get uh, PETA excited. Oh, yeah, no, you don't want to compress a badger. They will get angry. They were bitey. Um, Total Noob says, by the way, for those that play Bolt Action, Warlord leaked that the next starter box will be the War in the Desert, DAK, and Desert Rats Plastics with the Plastic 88. Should be June or July. Yeah, I, did, I, I walked past their booth a bunch, and I didn't... They had, like, demos going on and stuff like that, but I did not see that about um, the new plastic starter box. That's really cool. I, I, I just, uh, you know... I, I can see myself maybe doing... I could definitely see myself doing um, Conflict 47. Like, I, I own the stuff. I just need to find the time and, and, and probably have to do two armies because I don't know anybody else in the area, so I'm going to have to probably su support, uh, supply both sides. But... Um, yeah, I don't know. I still don't know about Bolt Action. Not that it's not a bad game. It's not. It's a bad game at all. I just, like, I like my historical to still have some, you know, Nazi zombies and some laser tanks. You know what I mean? Like, I still need it to be a little bit alternate history as opposed to real history. I don't know why that is. But that's my that's my jam. Let's just say that. <clears throat> uh, what else have we got here? Torch says that Steinal Res is my favorite primer. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, I've Yeah, I've been generally happy with it. You have to shake it like crazy. Like, if it's been sitting for a long time, if you haven't used it in a while, you want to make sure to really shake the hell out of it. Um, that helps a ton. But, yeah, it's it's it, I've had good luck with it. So, uh, Grimlock Steve asks, Any advice on playing Path to Glory? in Age of Sigmar. I've just started playing a few months ago and I always lose. It takes me ages to learn and I feel stupid. Uh, I don't have any advice on playing it. No, I'm sorry. Um, but the trick is about playing games and then losing is that when you first start, that's going to happen. And it's okay. As long as you're having fun. Like if, 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 if losing all the time and you're like, oh, I, I've lost and I'm, I'm, I, I never have any fun when I lose, I don't know. Like, if you're playing the same person all the time and they're just constantly stomping on you, I can definitely see why that's not necessarily fun, certainly. Like, you're not... It, it'd be like you being in a... You know, like, oh, we're going to learn to box. Okay, cool. Well, I'm, you know, six foot eight and 400 pounds and you are, you know, made out of marshmallow. This is not going to be a fun time. I get it. Um, but if, if you're playing against different people and things like that and you're constantly losing, hopefully you're still having fun because it takes time and then there's you know, patience involved, but you will then learn. Um, the other trick, too, is that after you've done it for a while, even if you're like, geez, I'm not able to, you know, win against any of these games of people who've been playing for a long time, start, you know, trying to teach somebody else. Not so that you can just stomp on them all the time, but at least then you're you're getting somebody else at your level, and then hopefully the two of you will be able to play, and then hopefully the games will be a little bit more equal that way, but you're also getting more people in the hobby, which is always a good thing. So, um, yeah, I would I would look into that as well. Like I said, if you're always losing and you're playing against the same person, start trying to play against somebody else because maybe that person is not being, maybe they're being unneedingly rough on you. You know what I mean? Like if I was like really good at something and then I was trying to teach somebody else how to do it, I would not constantly just try to crush their face because that's that can be you know non enjoyable. Let's just say that. Um. Rashan says history would be a lot more exciting with laser tanks and Nazi zombies. Well, yeah, I mean that's kind of the point. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just it, it's not that I'm against history. Don't get me wrong. I just if I'm playing a game, I think I I don't know why, but just straight up real history or close to real history. Uh, just as for some reason in a, in a game, it does not entice me as much as having some sort of fantastical element to it. So yeah. Um, let's see. Clinton says, I think it would be awesome to have a tabletop game for alternate history with scythe uh, theme being steampunk style battle suits alongside horse riders and hot air balloons. I'm pretty sure that there's some of that going on already. I mean, really, uh, Shattered Crown from Gaddis Gaming is a World War I uh, history, uh, alternate history type game. So you've got, you know, uh, Tesla coil tanks and you've got some... World War One style. Uh, actually, I saw some pictures of World War One style, um, like power armor type things. So there's there's some of that. 
you know, that's the scythe kind of that that board game has a very visual style that looks kind of alternate history World War One kind of, which I think is cool. And Shattered Crown from Gaddis, he does the the same thing. Gaddis's booth was directly behind um, Moderator Matt's Wreckage booth at Adepticon. They were they were back to back, and um, and Gaddis was at TMX too. So I'm familiar with the stuff, uh, but it's it's cool looking stuff. Ted says, Uncle Adam, do you play any tabletop RPG game, Pathfinder, or D&D? Um, I haven't for years and years and years and years. My very first, like, nerd game, like, not Monopoly or Sorry or whatever, my first, like, you know, what we would consider gaming, uh, uh, that was fifth grade Dungeons and Dragons. So that's kind of where I all started with this stuff. Um, that being said, we are picking up, actually at work now, at, at, at you know, where we make game for, we're going to start doing 5th um, edition Dungeons & Dragons uh, during lunch. I think currently the plan is we're going to try doing it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I have designed a Dwarven Cleric with scale armor and a mace, as one does. Uh, and so, yeah, we're going to be trying that out. Um, I Like I said, I haven't played since... Well, I played for a little tiny bit in 3rd edition, or else it was 3.5. It was either 3rd or 3.5. Played a little bit for a while. I was like me and my wife and some other friends and somebody else was being a GM. And that was cool. Um, but we didn't do it for super long. Um, and so I haven't played like... So it's been more than 10 years easy. And now uh, from everything I'm hearing, 5th edition is, is awesome. So I bought the 5th edition player's handbook somewhere. Where did I... Oh, from my local shop. I was, was going to buy it at a convention for some reason. And then I didn't. I instead bought it from my local shop. So my local shop has a like a loyalty card thing so as you spend money then like every hundred bucks you get like 15 bucks like a like a gift certificate so um that's why i try to buy stuff from my local shop um zombicide should have went with nazis instead of sci-fi space for the next release you know but you don't see a lot of sci-fi zombies though so that's kind of i don't i i think that it went out relatively well you know i could see that Um, what else have we got here? JP Got Rockets says, pretty much VJ Moore, if I just get tired of putting up uh, gotchas in the current rules, putting up with gotchas, talking about orcs, uh, if you if you don't, if you're sick of losing, you should play orcs, says VJ Moore, then you don't care if you win or lose, as long as there is mayhem. The orcs are getting a new book, so hopefully, or I think they're about to get a new book, aren't they? Pretty sure, soon. They're getting a new book soon, so hopefully it will, and hopefully some new models too. That'd be really nice. I'd like to see some nice new models. Like, they haven't really come out with any much new Orc 40K models since, like, the big giant Gorkonaut or whatever and some other pieces a couple of years back, like, in 7th, I think. So I'd like to see some new stuff uh, for them as well. Douglas Hooker says, Historical games have a beardy stigma. Beardy. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting around to play my Sharp Practice Two Fat Lardies Napoleonics light game aimed at Bernard Cornwell fans. Yeah, no, there is definitely a very, you know, generally it's it's an older audience. It is a, a, a more serious, at least on the surface, audience. They still have a good time, you know. I was at a small historical convention in Appleton, Wisconsin back in January, and they were all having a good time, but it was still, yeah, it was a lot of, you know... Um, I don't know. It's a different tone, obviously, because it's stuff that sort of kind of happened. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, you're playing in a different way. This is not... I mean, there are some people who play, like, this is almost exactly as close as we can get to how this initial battle started, and now we're going to see if we can make the outcome change or whatever. Then there's other people who are just like, we're going to play bolt action. Here's a road. Here's a building. These two groups are going to come together and fight each other, which is also fine. Or maybe there's objectives or whatever. Um... There's a lot of different levels to historical gaming, whether it's being almost a simulation type thing where we're trying to like do this down to like let's just use some forces and have a fight, um, and that's fine. But um, yeah, it does have. I don't want to say it has a stigma, but it does have a definite tone. Uh, historical gaming. Um, the other thing is too is that there's not a lot of skirmish. There there are some, but there's not a lot of skirmish historical games. 
and and because of that it's again it's got the same problem that say like warhammer fantasy had sort of at the end we're like hey you want to get into warhammer fantasy that's cool you have to do this and this and this and you need this many people and it's a whole thing and it's humongous and that scares people away so starting to see some more kind of historical skirmish type games that are starting to come out a little bit here and there i think is going to help i mean like uh actually right now um warstein studios who's it's run by a friend of mine uh He's painting up my Test of Honor, which is uh, like samurai era Japanese kind of historical skirmish. He's painting up my Test of Honor guys, and uh, so those will be done hopefully in the next month or so. Um, and uh, I'm trading him for um, uh, graphic work for the you know logo for his studio and and uh, all that stuff because that's kind of my area of expertise and I'm like I could paint them but I didn't have as much time and so he you know he was tired of he'd been painting a lot of Eldar at the time and so I was like well these guys aren't Eldar and he's like well you're not wrong so um yeah uh that's kind of the deal we're working out but I'm looking forward to trying that out and and kind of seeing a little bit more of a skirmishy kind of historical thing though it's not you know there's no laser samurai so it's more historical than most anything else that I play so I got that going for me I don't I don't though I would play a game with laser samurai probably don't the Tau have any laser samurai? It sounds like they should. Uh, Philip asks, is your D&D gaming going to be theater of the mind or miniature heavy? My players had issues with mini heavy as they got bogged down of where exactly everything was exactly. Um, I don't think it's going to be miniature heavy. We are going to have a map. Like we're going to, you know, at least to start, like I talked about earlier, we're going to get one of those probably mats by Mars that you can use the wet erase markers on and so then we can say okay this is going to go on so we'll probably have a miniature for each person and then maybe like dice for the other people um you know like oh these these are all orcs these dice over here and these dice over here are all you know i don't know skeletons whatever um i don't know that we're gonna go crazy with the minis we could if we wanted to down the road but to start we probably are just gonna be like that like when i first started playing D D back in the day it was all theater of the mind. There was no, you didn't even draw stuff. Like the guys that I played with, we didn't draw anything. He just like, the DM was like, well, these guys are about this far away from you. And you would just remember that or he would remember it. And then, you know, it, yeah, there was no like, well, this guy can't see this guy because this guy's in the way or there's a pillar or anything like that. It wasn't like that at all. It's very much more just like, these are the things that are happening and you just paid attention to what the GM was saying or the DM technically. Um... Riot54 says, is it time for the swag booty? Uh, actually, that was quite some time ago. Uh, I showed off, so you'll want to go back and watch the beginning part. I actually went through all of the the stuff. These are all the bags. There's bags and bags and boxes down here. So I'm sorry you missed it, but you can watch it um, in the previous uh, part of the thing. So yeah, it's been there. Um... Torch says, Brink of Battle is a historical skirmish game. It's pretty good. I have not heard of Brink of Battle. I'll have to check that out. Llama Juice says, started looking at TMX. 14-hour trip on the motorcycle sounds like fun. Anyone know if the rooms would be available Friday or Sunday night? Probably. I mean, like, if you call, I would call. There's a, there's, there's a number on the website. I'm 98% sure the, the number is still on the website. Um, but if you call them, they should be able to tell you that, I think. Uh, Rashan says laser samurai equals Jedi. Mm, yeah, no, that's actually a very good point. You pretty much, yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. I'm hoping that some company, says Legionnaires, I'm hoping that some company makes a Lovecraft horror army soon. I'm including Mantic's Night Stalker's Kickstarter in this. Well, I mean, this company from earlier in the video, um, so, okay, we don't, you know, that's... That's, uh, you got deep ones right there, you know, they're called Masters of Devil Reef. It says Cthulhu 28s. I mean, that's, if you go look at these guys, it's a company called Crucible Crush Miniatures. You got some, they've got, they've got miniatures for, for Cthulhu Lovecraftian type stuff for days. So that's something to think about. Um, you know, they don't, I, I think they have a system. I think it's called Pulp Adventures, but I could be wrong. So you, that's something to take a look at, too. Um, so, yeah, check that out. 
Douglas Hooker says, It feels like a lot of historical gamers like to reenact a battle, but that often means large encounter and is off-putting to painting and collecting cost-wise. I like 28mm, not 6mm Waterloo. Yeah, I, I could see that. I mean, if you wanted to do a huge Waterloo battle in 28, that's going to be even more expensive, which I think is why a lot of historicals like to go for the, the small 6mm, because then you can have a huge battle of, like, you know, again, very rank and flank and moving all this stuff around, but then it's not as expensive because the guys are all, like, that big. So, um, yeah. I still just prefer to paint 28 millimeter, and that's part of it right there. And I prefer to push them around that way. Like, yeah, I think that's that's one of the reasons why I lean more towards moving towards Conflict 47 and stuff like that. Even though I already have a Flames of War army, it's just the Flames of War scale is eh, I'm not sure about. Like, I I kind of enjoyed it initially, and it was fun to like build the little villages and make the, all that happen, and then have the tank battles and stuff. But we haven't played it in a while. I mean, since the new edition of Flames of War came out fourth. Um, we haven't played once, so we need to go through and read the rules, the guys that I've played with in the past, and sort of figure that out. Um, I need to talk to Josh about that. But yeah, that's maybe a thing. So, I don't know. I I think that's one of the reasons I just I just prefer 28 millimeters to scale. Um, hmm. JP Got Rocket says... Check out Song of Drums and Tomahawks. It's a, at $15, there's a lot of historical thumbnails about early settlers and uh, Native Americans. It's based on the Song of Blades and Heroes rules. Yeah, they've also got one called Song of Drums and Shakos, which is more his, uh, Napoleonic, I believe. So, yeah, I've been meaning to look at that one, uh, but I haven't yet. Yeah. Um, Nicholas says, What are your thoughts on the Ideneth re reveal? And then someone responded by saying, he's already commented twice on the wet elves. Yeah, that's pretty much it, wet elves. Uh, I was really hoping for bug-eyed fishmen, and instead we got wet elves. So uh, I don't don't plan on buying any. But, you know, elves. I'm not going to buy elves anyway, so yeah. Gaddis Gaming says that Dust also has a new army based off of Lovecraft creations. That's cool. I'm, I, I walked past the Dust booth a whole bunch, but I didn't see that. I should check out their website. Um, yeah. Any rumors of GW releasing Imperial Knight Renegade set since the new Imperial Knights Codex is dropping? Uh, I don't know. It, it would be kind of nice because, like, there was the original, like, that Imperial Knights game, and they had, like, extra stuff to sort of chaos up your Imperial Knight, and that stuff's hard to come by. They did show off... So, okay... And, you, and you've probably seen this video, I think now, if you've been looking on the Warhammer community website. They did this reveal, and they talked about, oh, and this is new, and it's coming, and whatever, and they show this video. And there's this guy, like, walking, like, it's an actual person, I'm pretty sure. It wasn't, like, a CG thing. It was just, like, an actor, like, walking down a long hallway. And he had a big beard, and he was walking along, walking along, and talking about stuff. And I'm like, and I was looking at his, at his armor and his outfit, and I'm like, is that guy an Inquisitor? That's kind of cool. So maybe they're going to have a new Inquisitional book, you know, or Inquisition book or whatever. Uh, and so I was like, all right, maybe. But then he started talking about, and he had this long beard, and he started talking about, you know, ancient grudges and, and holding ancient grudges and stuff like that. And then I started to get super excited because I was like, oh, my God, they're bringing back the squats. They're bringing back space dwarves. Because what my hope was at the end of this hallway, he was going to get to the end of the hallway, and he was going to be standing next to a normal human, but he was only going to be up to about here on him or whatever. And then you were going to re realize that this guy who was very stocky and had a big beard was actually a dwarf and a space dwarf. I'm like, oh my god, they're bringing back space dwarves. And instead it was just Imperial Knights. Which, Imperial Knights are cool, but we all kind of knew they were probably going to come out with an Imperial Knights book because they kind of need to. So that's about like them making like a big announcement. Oh, we're going to come out with an orc codex. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, it was like originally I was like, oh, Inquisition. Cool. And then I was like, oh, my God, they're bringing back squats. And then they didn't. It was just, you know, that. But in that video, if you watch it, um, they also show off a new Imperial Knight, which is like a good deal taller than a normal one. I think it's called a Castellan or something like that. It's just huge. Um so that'll be an interesting kit to check out. It'll be interesting to see how much it costs, too. Um, but it's big. It's, like it's supposed to be a very large um, Imperial Knight. They had some pictures of it, I think, next to regular size knights. And, uh, yeah, it's big. Got guns on his shoulders, which is, you know, people like shoulder guns. Um, 
Mr. Blue Sky says, moist elves, great display in my fish tank. Well, they would be, except they're also very pointy. So I think you might get a fish that gets poked on it, which you don't want to poke your fish. You know what I mean? Like that, you don't want a bleeding fish. That's going to suck. So don't do that. Also, I think the acrylic paint would come off. You, there's a lot of things that you should not put in your fish tank. A friend of mine, years ago, when we were in grade school, we wanted, he had like a plastic, like VW bug like that from and he wanted he thought it'd be fun to to sink it in his fish tank so it looked like this plastic VW bug was upside down upside down sunk in his fish tank but if it floated so we were trying to figure out what to use to to weight it down so we weighted it down with pennies and then I think most of his fish died so that we felt bad about that because the fish were because they did not dig the whole it's something about the copper I don't know if all the all the coins turned green and it was weird and then yeah we we got in trouble um but anyway yeah uh so do, just i'm always wary about putting stuff in the fish tanks i mean i don't have a fish tank because i have cats because then we get a cat in the fish tank which nobody wants that either um not the cat not the fish not certainly not me um where the hell was i going i don't know don't put the wet elves into the fish tank just fyi it would look cool it'd be a fun picture I mean, they kind of did it themselves, really. They had that like that boat thing, and there's the fish swimming. In them. Yeah, but the, the, hopefully that fish is okay. Um, do 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 do. JP Got Rocket says Dust has some crazy sales at Gen Con last year. I almost spent money. Oh well, that's that's. Rashan says squats sound like something you get after a bad meal. Well, <laughs> you know, sometimes. Um. But the the squats, like, I never even played 40k when the squats were around, but they were basically space elves. Or, sorry, space dwarves. And then they were, like, you know, they, like, grew up on, like, a heavy G world, so they were all, like, lower, you know, and they were beefier and and, and, and stockier because they were on a heavy G world, heavy gravity world. Uh, and then all of a sudden one day they put out a new, and I don't know which edition it was, but then a new, a new edition of 40k came out, and they had never existed. They're just like, mm, nope, there's no squats. I don't know what you guys are talking about. And people were kind of bummed because they're like, hey, I have this squat army, and now you say they don't exist anymore. Um, but again, that was before my time in 40k, but I've heard stories. But if you look at them, I, I swear, if you look at the current version of the 8th edition book, there's like a fluff section I think in the back and there's a, a couple of sections in it where like stuff is marked out like it's been redacted but if you look at it close enough I swear to god you can see the word squats in there so um, what else can we do here uh, some people said, oh yeah, Mac the Maker was saying that that guy walking on the hallway with the big beard, he thought that was Old Man Russ, uh, but it was not. One of the Primarchs. But yeah, no, I don't know what they're doing with that. Someone asked about that too during the actual press thing, but I, yeah, they were like, well, we're working on it. Uh, Johannes says, Warpath, they have their own take on basically called Forge Fathers. Yeah, they have Space Dwarves at uh, um, Warpath is Mantic's sci-fi game, and they have the Forge Fathers. They're in Warpath, they're in Dead Zone. Firefight is just a skirmish version of Warpath, so I, that's not like a separate game, kind of technically, but yeah. Um, but yeah, those are those are interesting models too. I've seen those. I own. I think I own a small um, Dead Zone, like the little starter box for the Forge Fathers. They didn't come in the original set. I think it was an extra kit that you could buy. I think I picked them up at Gen Con several years back. Evidently, uh, allegedly, all of the spot, all of the squats were eaten by the Tyranids. That's right. I had forgotten about that. That all the all of the the squats uh, were eaten by Tyranids. That happens, you know. I mean, sometimes. Um, VJ Morph says the lion is supposedly the next Primark coming. Yeah, I I don't know. I've never bought like any of those we were just talking about those at the shop recently about how those forge world primarchs they just don't at least for me personally like i don't know like some of the sculpts i just don't i don't know what it is we we were all kind of sitting around talking about forge world and about how sometimes he can be a little hit or miss like uh one guy that we know there recently was just building the new well, not the new but the fire raptor and how that kit was very difficult to put together sometimes um the Primark kits are not usually difficult to put together at all, usually. 
uh, vehicle kits can be sometimes with with Forge World, but the Primark kits, he was I don't know. There was another guy who was just like I. They really liked because you got your plastic uh, Bobby G there, you know your uh, your Rabuto Gilliman or whatever, um, and that's a pretty good kit. But there was just some commiserating happening at the at the shop, but that they wished that all the Primarchs were those kind of plastic kits like that because they would work a lot nicer and they would look a lot nicer. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just. I don't want to run a Primark, you know? Like, I just, that's not my thing. I don't know why. I just don't, like, story-wise, like, if he croaks, I'd be like, well, that doesn't make any sense. He shouldn't really be able to, really, you know what I mean? So, that's why I don't run those. Anyway. Like, the Angron one. The Angron one is kind of weird-looking. The Fulgrim one, I think, is kind of weird-looking, too. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Commissar Ludfang says, also, there is a squat-hired gun in Necromunda. That's true. They did show that model off, and I thought that's kind of cool. I don't, I haven't seen it in my local shop yet, so I don't know if it's been released yet or not. But, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is 11 p.m. my time, or no, it's not 11 a.m. my time, and uh, uh, the show is done. I've got to go to Easter lunch. Actually, we're going to go over to my in-laws and have some ham and um, other things. And um, so I, I appreciate everybody. Coming and taking a look at my booty, if you know what I mean. Uh, that's the eyebrow thing right there. Um, that's uh, that's the stuff that I brought back from from Adepticon, um, and you will see more of it once the most of that terrain's been all painted up, and you'll see it on tables coming soon in some sort of bat reps. I'm not strategically minded particularly. I enjoy gaming. I'm not good at it particularly, and so my bat reps will be less about battle reports and hopefully more about uh, battle fun. Maybe I'll just change the name. Maybe I won't call them battle reports. I'll call them battle fun. No, that's a terrible name. I'll come up with something. Um, but yeah, we'll be doing that coming up soon because of the new studio. I've got the space now to be able to do that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff coming. And uh, and I hope that uh, and none of it is April Fool's because I think that stuff is dumb. It's not my, not my thing. Um, so hopefully you guys have a good day. And, uh, and, and I'll see you in two weeks and, um, I'll be doing more videos and hopefully we'll see you at uh, a convention near you soon. Like I said, I'm going to Origins in Columbus, Ohio. I'm going to be going to hopefully the Nova Open towards the end of August, I think is when that one is. That one's over by Washington, D.C. Um, other areas. I'm going to be, I'm going to be all over the, 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 this year Matthew Sears says maybe a hotel room bat rep at Little Wars I think that's possible as well we'll see how that goes uh, potentially alright anyway um, have a good day and we'll see you in two weeks for the next Every Other Sunday show thanks for watching